Good afternoon and welcome to the ELEX webinar, Steps in a Digital Preservation Workflow. I'm Kristen Martin, a member of the ELEX Continuing Education Committee. Today, Bill LaFergie will be presenting. Bill is the Digital Initiatives Project Manager with the Library of Congress in the National Digital Information Infrastructure and Preservation Program. He is responsible for overseeing digital preservation product, projects and partnerships with a variety of universities, state archives and libraries, and other organizations. He is a frequent speaker on digital preservation at venues around the world. Um, as Bill's giving his presentation, if you have questions, please type them into the question box on your screen, and then Bill will do his best to answer them at the, beginning, at the conclusion of the presentation. Also, please note that the session will be recorded, and you will receive an email shortly after the conclusion of the webinar with a link to the recording. At that time, you can also receive a copy of Bill's slides. Finally, if you're interested, the ELEC-CE committee invites you to use the Twitter back channel, hashtag ELEC-CE, to interact with other participants during the webinar. However, please note that um, questions should continue to be submitted through the question box, and neither the presenter nor me will be monitoring the Twitter feed during the presentation. But it's just a chance for you to communicate with some other attendees. So now I'm going to turn the presentation over to Bill, and there'll be just a slight delay. Hello, uh, this is Bill LaFergie, and I'm very glad to be talking with you about digital preservation workflows today. Now, I did see a tweet earlier expressing the hope that I would start with some kind of a joke about digital preservation workflows, and this led to a little bit of panic on my part since this is a subject that I think is pretty hard to joke about. Uh, but I did my best, and I checked the internet. Uh, did really couldn't find anything that looked appropriate. Uh, the best I could really do is to um, I got to a site that talked about doing uh, workflows for writing jokes. Uh, I think that would actually make for a pretty good presentation in its own right, but really doesn't help me here. So with that, I hope you'll excuse me for diving right in to the matter at hand. I'm going to discuss how you can plan and build a stage process for preserving digital information. By staged, I mean steps to bring in content and place it under some kind of administrative and technical control. I'll be talking from the perspective of a library, archives, or other cultural heritage institution that has a, mid a mission to keep digital information and to make it available. This information can be in any form. It can be text, it can be images, databases, data sets, and so forth. My intent is to talk about things in a way that's relevant to wherever you are in terms of a digital stewardship process or infrastructure. If you have a full-fledged digital preservation repository with terabytes of stored content, I hope there are some worthwhile points here. By the same token, if your institution is just getting started, uh, and I know there are plenty of those out there, there should be some key pieces of information uh, in this presentation for you to consider. I'll spend some time covering how to conceptualize a workflow. I think the best way to do this is from a dynamic life cycle perspective, and I'll tell you why. The key thing to remember is that all kinds of variables come into play with workflows. One size really does not fit all. Some institutions have policies and practices that drive very detailed workflows, while other places can uh, make do with comparatively simple methods. And I'll get into uh, some details about how this works. I'll show you lots of diagrams and models and each one of these should have a URL, so you can go and learn more about um, some of the specific uh, uh, diagrams that, I, that I'm going to be talking about. And I'll also give you some ideas for um, linking up um, some individual preservation tools and services to be able to meet specific um, stewardship activities. And one more thing I should uh, be upfront about, uh, my uh, habit is to uh, interchange the terms digital preservation and digital stewardship. Uh, to me, they mean basically the same thing. 
Uh, it's all the work that cultural heritage institutions do to manage and serve uh, their digital collections over time. So here's my entire presentation, basically, boiled down to one slide. And there are three basic points. First, it's um, never too early or too late to think about starting or improving a workflow for digital preservation. Most importantly, don't feel that you need a team of experts or an expensive infrastructure. The big thing is to get started, uh, however modestly that may be, and work for improvement over time. The second point is that every workflow needs to be customized to meet individual needs, and sometimes customized to address specific kinds of content. You can't easily grab uh, and a workflow from somebody else and make it work for you. Uh, the good news is that there's really only uh, a few basic questions that you need to address. And the more good news is that the answers can be flexible. If your resources are limited, you can still develop an initial process. If you start with a small amount of test content, that's fine too. Uh, the key is to scope a project that's within your means and helps to advance your institutional capabilities. And the third point is the best thing to do is to get started with a basic workflow model that you can test, even if that's only on a pilot basis. That gives you some practical experience that you can use to improve what you're doing and move forward with your digital stewardship activities. So, uh, what is a workflow? Uh, I've been tossing the term around uh, quite a bit so far, so let me define what I mean by workflow. Uh, the simple definition is a sequence of connected steps to accomplish an activity from start to finish. The focus of a workflow is practical. It outlines specific tasks that people and machines need to do. And in most cases, these tasks are intended to be repeated multiple times to deal with a regular or in intermittent flow of new digital information. And a workflow can be very basic with just a few steps, or it can be very detailed with all kinds of steps, sub-steps, and contingencies. And it really all depends on where you are and how you define your needs. A digital preservation workflow aims to meet an institution's stewardship objectives. And by that I mean getting certain kinds of digital content, doing what you need to keep it persistent, and making it available to users. We often frame this in um, the language of the Open Archival Information System Reference Model, OAIS. And we use terms like ingest, archival storage, access, and so on. Now, there's not currently any one best, ideal, perfect workflow. Most institutions are still grappling with how best to implement the OAIS ideas. Uh, we've only been doing this for a few years, and so there isn't a whole lot of community experience. And on top of that, uh, technology is bounding ahead and um, changing all the time, so it's a moving target. And on top of that, even, uh, the idea about what it means to preserve digital information uh, is open for debate. Uh, when we talk about preservation, do we just preserve the original bits, or do we have to normalize them into some sort of a special format? Uh, can we rely on a few pieces of metadata, or do we have to provide lots and lots of metadata? Uh, can we rely on the existing computer environments, or do we have to emulate entirely um, old environments to be able to make sense of older data? Um, and there's no easy answer to, to any of those questions. So ultimately, each institution needs to look to its own individual resources and requirements to determine how best to steward digital content. And we all have to keep an eye on what others in the community are doing uh, to be able to, to um, adopt new ways of doing things. And a final point uh, that I need to make is that uh, 
Uh, workflow is a term commonly used in conjunction with uh, scanning, digitizing books and other analog materials. Uh, I consider this distinct from digital preservation, although after materials are in a digital form, they can be put into a preservation workflow. So when I talk about workflow, I'm not talking about digitization. Now, a couple of other points in relation to this institutional approach. Workflows should be informed by larger community ideas, standards and practices. I mentioned OAIS, and that's one example. Workflows should also be thought of as closely interwoven with overall institutional policy, infrastructure, and financial sustainability. Another way to say this is that workflows shouldn't be developed in isolation or to meet um, excessively narrow objectives. Now, what you see on the screen here is this triangle diagram from the University of Michigan Digital Preservation Workshop, and it does a pretty good job of illustrating the uh, interlinked institutional approach to thinking about workflows. Now here's another diagram from the GoPortis project in Europe that I think does a nice job of explaining the connection between institutional policies and workflows. Uh, as this diagram shows, uh, the ideal way to proceed is that you should first develop a digital preservation policy concept, then refine the policy uh, for implementation. And after you've got your policy, you should um, then use that as the basis to develop a workflow concept and then refine the workflow for implementation and deployment. And what's also useful about this diagram that it makes it clear that every step is uh, along this process is being driven by individual assumptions and constraints, uh, which, as I've said a couple of times now, um, is quite variable among institutions. Another consideration for developing workflows is a concept known as the digital life cycle. Several different models are offered uh, for life cycle. Uh, here's a pretty basic one from uh, JISC in the United Kingdom. Um, life cycle models are um, particularly useful for wrapping your mind around, around what it means for an institution to steward digital content. Um, and the life part of the life cycle can uh, extend all the way to the point of data creation if, if you want it to. Uh, in fact, uh, it can extend even before the point of creation if we want to factor in optimal preservation qualities for information to be created in the future. So it might be easier to preserve once it actually comes into, into custody. Lifecycle models and workflows are related concepts. You can think of the life cycle as the highest level of abstraction, uh, or the big picture, if you will. Um, it identifies the major chunks of sequenced activity that can be further defined through individual workflows. Um, and again, lots of variability in how people think about the digital life cycle. Um, and let me show you some models. Here's one from New Zealand that's uh, oriented towards active use. Um, it's, it's really effective for outlining uh, a number of stages involved in the creation and management of digital content. Um, it does really well to indicate that these stages are circular and recurring. Um, a user could, for example, uh, create a digital object that another user modifies, which in turn generates a new object that needs to be managed. That's that circular business in the middle there, um, uh, which is again oriented towards, towards use. Um, now this particular model regards preservation as a, as a relatively static activity. It's that little, uh, little uh, box off to the far right. 
Now here's another life cycle model from the Digital Curation Center in the United Kingdom. Um, don't strain your eyes too much on this. It's a, it's a pretty complicated uh, diagram. It's also a really comprehensive view of all the stages seem to be involved with preserving content and making it as useful as possible over long periods of time. A key assumption underneath this particular model is that institutions should devote a fair amount of resources to regularly transform, describe, and otherwise process content, um, which is a choice that um, an institution can make to do, uh, to, to undertake, um, but it's also a choice that other institutions may not want to make because it um, calls for a, um, a level of resource commitment that um, not all institutions can afford. Um, what this model is, does really well is um, linking together all the many different stages um, involved in um, managing content, digital content, and it also illustrates the recurring processes that are involved with selecting, keeping, and serving content over time. One of the key aspects of digital preservation is some degree of active management. You can't just leave it, um, leave it like a book on a shelf. You've got to re relatively regularly do something with it, even if it's only moving it um, to uh, to different storage, uh, different storage devices or media. Um, what I also like about this particular diagram is that it allows for periodic reappraisal of uh, preserved digital information. It even allows for potential disposal. Um, uh, personally, I agree with the fact that just because we bring in digital data at one point uh, in time doesn't necessarily mean that we can't eventually decide that it lacks sufficient value for ongoing retention. And here is the most complex life cycle model that I'll show you. It's from the CASPER project in Europe, and again links stages into a big picture sequence. Actually, if you look at the three big patches of color here, the diagram becomes quite a bit simpler. Uh, the red is the data creator, the green is the institutional curator or preserver, uh, and the blue is the, is the data user. And those three sort of considerations are um, really at the heart of pretty much any kind of a life cycle concept. What they've done here is um, added a number, of, um, a number of different activities that they see as part of um, the management of content over time. So, let's talk about workflows directly. This diagram uh, here presents uh, a workflow at the most basic level that I could think of anyway. Um, and it really could be used in conjunction with a specific batch of content. Um, actually, you would probably use something like this um, as, a, as a really early simple test um, because each step does require some more explanation. For example, how do you check the content? But the point here is that you could start with something pretty simple, um, document your experience, um, what you learn, and then use that to refine your process um, to to make it as um, to make make it as granular as as it needs to be to do what you need to do. So let's look at some other approaches to planning and implementing preservation workflows. Here's a good example from Penn State University, which relies on use cases to build out specific preservation workflows. Um, I, I find that this is good because um, uh, the actions that need to be, for, be performed are described as narratives, uh, which is comparatively easy to gather from people involved in the preservation process. People can just use their own words to say what it is that has to happen. Uh, you record um, 
you record their view, and then you can deconstruct those narratives into concrete sequential tasks. It, it can be easier to do this rather than try to start developing a sequence before you have a complete idea about, um, about what people are expecting. Now here, this diagram sort of takes us rather more deeply into a workflow process. And it allows you to tie specific actions to specific tools. Um, it's actually, this diagram is from the um, Archivematica preservation system. Um, and it, um, the detail is one step in processing content, digital content. Um, and here it happens to be they're placing some new content into what they call quarantine computer storage. Um, and the microservice that has to take place at this particular point is uh, to perform a virus check on the content uh, to make sure that it isn't um, infected with something nasty. And they actually also indicate that they have a tool used for this particular process, which is the CLAM antivirus tool. What's really useful about this is that it demonstrates um, a modular approach, um, which is, I think, the best way to think about, to think about workflows, uh, because it allows for ongoing development and refinement. Um, for example, the CLAM antivirus is a perfectly fine tool that does a really good job at this point, but in some, at some um, stage in the future, there may be something better, and um, what you can do is then swap it out for, uh, swap the existing tool out for the new tool. Um, and um, that makes it clear that that's, that's entirely feasible here. This is the full scope of the Archivematica workflow from start to finish. Please don't try to read it. It's pretty hard on the eyes, probably, on the screen here. Um, the diagram is um, pretty interesting because it offers a full range of steps uh, in microservices and tools um, involved in stewarding content. Um, now, just because it offers all those steps and all those microservices and all those tools doesn't mean that any particular institution has to, um, has to uh, adopt it um, as, it's, as it's presented here. Uh, the intent is that it can be customized to be able to meet individual needs. And that would be true for um, any, any kind of workflow. Now, we hear a lot about the cloud these days, um, but the idea of distributed digital preservation services has been around for a little while now. Um, the idea is that um, a workflow can involve tools or processes that reside uh, outside a particular institution. In other words, all the work does not have to go on within the four walls of your institution. Um, a lot of these distributed um, tools and processes are web-based. And um, the example on the screen here is one from the University of North Carolina Digital Repository. The bottom box in the workflow, uh, that's the IRODS grid um, box down there near the bottom, um, is a network of computers and storage um, that's in the cloud. It's, uh, it's distributed uh, at, different, uh, at different points um, on, on, on a different, different in infrastructure, and it's all linked up uh, via the internet. And uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, at this point, that just about every part of a digital preservation, preservation workflow could, in theory, operate in a distributed manner. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages of this. Um, disadvantages are, you know, you, you don't control everything. There could be privacy issues. Um, you have to make sure that you're services and your providers are reliable. Um, and so a lot of this is still being worked out. Uh, but there are clear advantages. And um, 
primarily the advantages here are scale and cost. Um, it, it, services that are um, distributed can be scaled up much larger generally than um, um, institutionally. Um, and the cost, at least the idea is the cost can be a lot lower as well. Um, my own feeling is that we're probably going to be seeing an increase in cloud-based preservation services simply because of um, efficiency and, and cost. Now, some workflows can really drill down into very deeply into specific preservation processes. And this can be the case for activities that are judged to be of especially high value that are really important, or they can reflect uh, the results of improvement over time and a certain level of maturity for the system. If you've been testing and refining and applying good experience and good learning to what you're doing, um, eventually what you're going to wind up with is something um, which you see on the screen here, perhaps even more detail, detail that you see on the screen here. Um, and this is um, a pretty detailed ingest workflow from the Public Record Office of Victoria in, uh, in Australia. If you're experiencing workflow exhaustion at this point in the presentation, uh, you'll be relieved to know that workflows can also be depicted in a more narrative manner without losing the sense of sequential action. And what I've got on the screen here is um, a pretty good example from the Portico website. Um, the, um, the, the diagram covers all the steps that Portico follows from preliminary preservation planning through to content delivery. And what they've done is rather than sort of indicating um, a, a particular flow of activities, they've just listed all the, the different types of steps and um, tasks that need to be done in conjunction with each one of these five major, um, I guess you could call them life cycle processes. And um, they also permit, what's really good about this is that um, it allows you to sort of get into it with a varying level of detail. If you click some of these links um, over on the, uh, the right-hand side where it says view images, you can get a um, tremendous amount of detail about things like um, technical metadata and um, checksums and all kinds of things like that. But um, at the same time, it also enables you to have have less, less information presented to give you an idea about the overall process. So uh, let me wrap up with a few final points here. Um, everybody is still looking to improve their digital preservation workflows. Um, so don't judge a perceived lack of progress too harshly. Um, the important thing to bear in mind is that now is a great time to get started in establishing or improving your preservation policies and processes. So in connection with this, if perhaps um, you're at an early stage um, of working with digital materials, um, you may want to consider um, doing some pilot workflows and um, be able to um, build a practical base of experience that you can use to um, gather more detail. Uh, now Clay Shirky worked with us a few years back here at the library and he used to tell us, um, he used to say, the system will never be optimized. And um, I think that was a profound comment then, I think it's still a profound comment. Uh, because it means that however well you do something today um, with, with digital content, preserving content, tomorrow's technology is going to offer better choices. And this is certainly true in, um, in what we're doing with 
with digital preservation because there is so much room for improving our tools and processes. Um, and of course, technology continues to uh, to continue to uh, uh, get better and better, uh, um, and offer us better ways of doing things. And um, the other uh, another thing to bear in mind is the concept of learn by doing, um, something else we talk about here at the library. Uh, and what this means is that the best way to seek solutions is to start where you can and build a practical base of experience and then, um, and then um, use it to improve. And what you're going to also want to be very careful about doing is keep an eye on what, other <clears throat> what others in the community are doing, um, their successes, and um, to some extent their failures also, um, and be able to apply those lessons to your own particular set of circumstances. And um, that way you can sort of have a collective, we have a collective um, way of, um, of advancing. And that's something that, um, that we're very interested in here at the library. So, what I've given you here on this final slide are a few selected citations um, relating to life cycles and workflows and uh, related concepts. And um, if you want to go and learn more about uh, some of these activities and some of these projects, um, please go check them out. And as I mentioned, the diagrams in the slides um, also have URLs. Um, and there's lots of good information there, and I've really only been able to sort of hit the tip of the iceberg for a lot of these. And uh, I encourage you to, to go and, um, and get more details about each one of these things that I've talked about. So thanks for listening, and I'll be happy to try and answer any questions you may have. Um, if you do have questions for Bill, please type them in the question box and we'll be able to um, answer the questions in the webinar. Has anybody been able to uh, have some experience with any of these uh, models or processes? I'd be interested to know that. Let's see. Um, we do have a question here asking if the Library of Congress has a formal workflow that's in place for digital preservation. Yeah, that's a good question. We actually have several workflows in place. Um, we have, um, the way it's, it's broken out in the library because of um, the, the large volume of content that we tend to deal with, is that it's very much focused on particular streams of content. For example, we work with the um, National Endowment for the Humanities on the National Digital Newspaper Program. And we get um, uh, large quantities of uh, scanned newspapers uh, that come in from all over the country. And we have a particular workflow that, um, that um, works with that content to be able to place it into, uh, into storage and then to be able to put it, um, to be able to access the information via the, um, via the web. We have a special site devoted to accessing that newspaper content. We also have a very large web archiving activity with many, many terabytes of content that we've collected over the years and that in itself is also a, an individu individualized workflow that involves moving rather large quantities of um, harvested websites um, into, into a storage environment and then providing um, access using, um, using a special um, user interface. And what, we've, um, what we have to do in, in that case is there's a, there's a lag in terms of when stuff is made available. Um, it's got to do with permissions and that sort of thing. And uh, we have to build in a, um, um, 
a process to be able to um, hold content for a certain amount of time and then make selected content available uh, when it's appropriate. So, and there are a couple of other examples like that as well. So, um, uh, when I was talking about variability um, earlier, um, I was basing it to, to some degree on the experience that we that we have here, and also on the fact that um, there isn't one workflow that we have. We actually have many. Um, we have another question asking if you have any more to say about the planning process. Yeah, the planning process. We um, here at the library have developed our own sort of ideas about the life cycle. Um, it's not quite ready for prime time yet, which is why I haven't displayed it. But we spent a lot of time talking about the planning process. And um, it, was, it was strongly felt that um, the more information that can be made available to content creators, uh, such as what formats, what digital kinds of formats um, should they use, um, what kinds of metadata would be, would be optimal to have into content, um, to hopefully influence good practices so that um, when somebody creates a certain type of um, a certain stream of content or a certain batch of content that it's as easy to preserve as possible. Uh, and we've been involved with certain kind of standard uh, standard activities. Um, we were involved in the um, um, portable document format PDFA standard, which has got preservation and, and long time long term access in mind um, as well. Um, there's another aspect to planning, and it's maybe it's a terminology thing which um, sometimes gets called preservation planning. And it's a little bit different. It's actually looking at the content that you've brought in and that, you, um, that you're holding and um, being able to make decisions about, well, it's time to move to a new, um, a new format. Um, say you've got format X and it's going obsolete, so we should move it to format Y. Um, and that's a process known as preservation planning. We've also um, we've also been, um, been doing some, some thinking about how best to do that. And they're both important. I mean, the, the whole idea is you want to be able to look ahead. and You want to be able to um, um, rash, make some rational decisions and rational ideas about how to proceed so that, um, so that your work becomes easier and so that your content is, is, is optimally available. All right, thanks. We have a question here about um, digital preservation systems from vendors. There are a number of vendors that license digital preservation systems. Do you have any advice for how to evaluate these systems and what people should be looking for? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there are a number of systems out there. Um, and the trend over the last number of years, I'm very glad to see that this is happening, is to develop uh, these open architectures. Um, uh, back in the day, and I suppose they still exist, um, systems tended to be based on a lot of proprietary code, a lot of proprietary design, so they weren't particularly transparent. And the danger was that you would be locked in, an institution would be locked in to one particular company, one particular way of doing things, and um, that that would become a real constraint over time, and that you wouldn't have flexibility into the future. What um, a lot of vendors are doing these days is a pro uh, developing a more open approach. And they'll be happy to give you certain, um, certain kinds of proprietary code, but it tends to be bundled in with more open source materials, open source programs, um, so that you can have a more modular approach um, to, um, to designing and building your systems. So certainly when it comes time to uh, think about going with a vendor, you're, you're going to want to ask them their views on open architecture and the, and the ability to be able to make use of um, open source tools, both open source packages that exist right now and 
any open source tools that may become available um, in the future. And of course, the $100,000 question really, or maybe it's the much larger dollar value question, is um, certainly at some point you're going to want to be able to move all your content onto a completely different computer platform. And that means you know, everything different. Um, servers and storage and processing programs. And you're going to want um, um, a preservation system that lets you do that. And again, vendors are becoming uh, more sensitized to that. And uh, there are a number of them out there that um, um, are ready to assure you that that's, that that's something that, that their systems will permit, and you just have to make sure that that's indeed the case. All right, thank you. We have another question. Do you know of any workflows that take into account testing of the tools being used? Hmm, testing of the tools. Well, um, not per se, but I would say that um, the Arc of Matica, which is an open source um, um, system, um, is, a, is a pretty good one in that it gives you a number of different options. Um, uh, I mentioned uh, antivirus. Um, I believe there actually are a couple of different antivirus open source packages out there. Um, so using that as a framework, you could, in theory, um, uh, apply the different tools and see how well they work for you. And you could do that at each step um, each step along the way. I'm not sure if that <laughs> gets exactly to the question that the person has, but uh, um, that's what I'd suggest. Okay. I'm um, going back to your previous question. Um, can you name any of the um, open source vendors that you were referring to? Oh. Um, we're not supposed to talk about specific vendors <laughs> um, because um, um, we, we don't want to seem like we're, we're playing favorites. Um, the, um, or at least commercial vendors. Um, the, um, when it comes to open source, um, there, I've mentioned a, a, a couple already. Um, I think if um, you go look at some of the major projects that are going on around the world, um, for example, the National Library of um, New Zealand, National Archives, National Library of New Zealand, um, British Library, and British National Archives, um, Dutch, Royal Dutch Library. Um, if you go to their websites um, for those institutions, they're all all of those places, are, I think, are really doing a good job. Um, they're, they've spent a, a fair amount of time thinking about this and trying to develop solutions. And I believe all of them, at one time or another, have worked with commercial vendors. And there should be information on their, on their websites about that. Um, do you consider the Internet Archive to be a commercial vendor? <laughs> Uh, we, do have a, we do have a question here wondering if you have any idea about how they deal with digital preservation. Yeah. Um, I don't think the Internet Archive would consider themselves to be um, a commercial vendor. They, I, I think they are a nonprofit. Um, and it's certainly public knowledge that we work with them um, with um, our, our, web, our, our web collecting and um, other activities. Um, they, I, I think, are good... Uh, example of dealing with massive quantities of content, and and they've been doing it for years now. Um, they um, they actually have many terabytes, petabytes, I believe, of of data, um, and they um, I'm I'm certainly not an expert in how in every step of the process that they that they work on, but they um, they focus on being able to store um, versions of websites and, and mostly the textual information. They don't, as far as I know, collect a lot of the more um, esoteric type of uh, digital information on websites. They tend to focus on the content and um, make, it, make it available through their, um, their Wayback Machine. And um, 
I, I think they, they do an exemplary job. Um, I have a question about a, a different type of workflow here. Wondering if you have any um, suggestions for um, developing a workflow to transition traditional cataloging departments into doing digital work. Hmm. To transition digital cataloging. Um, so with this, I'm assuming this would be just for metadata. I'll make that assumption. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's probably similar to dealing with other aspects of, of digital content. Um, you've just got to be able to figure out the individual steps. And probably cataloging m might be a little easier. Um, I'm sort of speculating here. It might be a little easier than some other aspects of um, digital preservation because cataloging is a, um, a fairly structured process that we have a lot of experience working with, um, at least with other types of media. Um, so uh, I, I'm, um, I'm thinking it probably would be um, not impossible to be able to line up the, the, the various kinds of requirements involved in the cataloging process and then be able to map them to um, a, digital, um, a digital workflow. Um, I think the tricky part would be that you would have to probably, you would definitely have to associate that with other aspects of digital preservation. For example, you've got the catalog information or the metadata about a content, a piece of content. You've got to keep that tied to the content. Um, and there's a, there's a, a science involved in, in doing that. And really what you're talking about there is um, getting, getting pretty deeply into, um, into a workflow process where you show how you can associate the metadata with, with, um, with the individual pieces of content. All right, thank you. Um, could you discuss the benefits of developing a digital preservation policy to support and underlay workflow development? Yeah, I think that's crucial. Um, the the GoPortis diagram that I showed earlier from uh, the European Go Portis project, um, I think really, um, and in fact, that whole project is, is worth exploring um, to kind of get into this question. Um, because there's a danger if you develop workflows independent of policies that the two are going to kind of diverge, and that doesn't serve institutional purposes. Um, for maximum value, really, you want your policy to drive your workflow. Um, and it's a little, in, in some respects, it might be a little bit of a chicken and the egg kind of question. Um, but uh, what GoPortis suggests is that uh, it, it's, it's, it's most useful to sort of think about it from a policy perspective. And that would be, uh, all right, I'm, I'm institution X and uh, we're going to deal with this particular type of content. Uh, for example, we're going to deal with um, harvested websites. And we're going to deal with harvested websites relating to this particular subject or this particular domain. Um, and um, our goal is going to be um, to collect um, primarily textual information and uh, we're not going to collect things like JavaScript. Um, we're not going to collect um, um, some, um, some other kinds of um, fancy functionality that some websites have. And we're going to make it um, accessible on our website um, after three years or something like that. So that's sort of, those are, each one of those involve a policy sort of determination. And once that gets formalized within the institution, then you've got a good solid basis to start building out your individual workflow applications because they tie directly into what the institution wants to do um, rather than um, approach the workflow first. Th then you've got the prospect of um, maybe getting more deeply involved with trying to preserve things like um, JavaScript and 
um, other kinds of um, exotic, more exotic types of um, data that's on, that's on the internet, and then discover that that's a problem. Um, so um, the, um, the, whole, the whole policy aspect of things, um, I think, is, is really the best place to start. And what the GoPortis project is, is good at sort of explaining is that, um, that that's an incremental process um, as well. Um, you don't have to have everything figured out immediately. You just you need to develop the concept, and then you refine the policy. And then from there, you, you start building your workflow. All right. Um, going back to the, the cataloging question, do you know of any workflows or resources that might specifically address trying to transition the traditional cataloging department to doing more digital work? Um, I can. I know that um, the library here, the Library of Congress, has um, been moving to a um, an, an ILS um, and has done that. Uh, over the last number of years. Um, that's not an area of my expertise, particular expertise, um, so I can't, I can't really um, talk in too much detail about that. Um, I'd be happy to sort of um, rummage through my notes and, uh, and uh, if I can find anything, I'd be happy to pass it on to the questioner. Okay. Um, we have a couple questions here that relate to metadata and I think looking for more information about how metadata relates to digital preservation. Oh, is that the question? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I, I would say in terms of how metadata would help in terms of retrieval and preservation of an archival file. Yeah. Well, metadata is crucial. Um, the issue, of course, is that uh, metadata can be um, can be involved and in, um, expensive to generate. Um, but um, it's it's certainly critical for discovery if you don't have basic metadata about um, a, an object and um, um, provenance uh, of the object. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to to, to make it a, to make it useful or, or to make it even discoverable at all. Um, beyond the sort of descriptive metadata, which is you know a pretty big category in and of itself, um, there is also also other kinds of metadata that um, relate to things like um, rights, if there's any kind of copyright um, um, involved. Um, Another important category is um, structural metadata. Um, you may want uh, to have um, digital objects structured in a certain way. You've got a table of contents, you've got uh, um, different chapters, and then yet a whole other category of metadata relates to preservation metadata, um, which uh, relates to things like well, what is what is the file format? Uh, what version of, of of the file format is it? Um, what kinds of um, embedded information are in the file? How big is the file? Um, is there a checksum associated with the file? Um, what kinds of preservation activities have already um, taken place um, in connection with this file? Um, and that kind of information is, um, is really important uh, when you get to the, the uh, preservation planning activity, which is you've got this content stored and um, you've had it for some time and you're thinking about maybe migrating it forward. Um, if you're, if you're going to do that, you know, it may be some version of you know, PDF or something. And you want to migrate all um, versions 1.2 and above. Um, so in that case, what you want to be able to do is have metadata that allows you to quickly identify that particular uh, instance of that file format and be able to take some sort of batch 
action on, um, on those objects. Um, and of course, the longer you're, you're keeping these files, presumably the more preservation activities that you're, you're going to be um, potentially considering. So um, there's actually quite a bit of um, preservation metadata that ideally you should have. And the, um, the premise uh, metadata specification, um, of course, is the, the central um, the central guide to, to all of that. And a lot of this kind of metadata you can extract automatically when you bring digital materials in if, um, if, you, if you have um, the capability to do that. Um, and of course the more automation that you can bring to meta metadata, metadata extraction and generation, um, um, the easier it is because to have people um, generate metadata tends to be very labor intensive and very expensive. Okay, um, that was the last question that we have. So I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap up the webinar. Let me just resume the slideshow here. Um, I'd like to thank you, Bill, for giving us this information um, regarding the processes for building and managing digital preservation workflows. And thanks to everyone who attended. We hope you found today's session useful. You'll soon receive a short online evaluation form, so please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. The comments that we get from these forms are reviewed by the Alexei Committee, and we use them to plan additional continuing education offerings. Um, there's information about all the Alex webinars, which is featured on the Alex website, which is now newly redesigned, and you can see the webinars listed in the online learning section. Um, and you can follow that link that's on the screen, too, to get to them. We have a number of webinars planned for later this spring, including another one where Bill is going to be presenting on April 26th, Preserving Your digital, your Personal Digital Photographs, and that's going to be freely available as part of the Alex Preservation Week events. There's more webinars that are being scheduled for the summer and the fall as well. We also welcome suggestions for webinars and other continuing educational opportunities, and you can suggest a webinar topic through the link to the Alex website that's on the screen. Finally, before we conclude, I'd like to thank Kiara Healy for providing technical support for today's webinar and Eva Sorrell for also joining on as technical support. She and her colleagues on the Continuing Education Committee's technical support subcommittee make it possible for us to present these webinars so smoothly. So thank you very much for joining us and have a nice afternoon.